Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order this meeting of the, the joint meeting of the Katati City Council and the successor agency to the former Katati Community Redevelopment Agency for this October 24th, 2023. So could we please have a roll call? Councilmember Rivers. Present. Councilmember Lemus. Here. Councilmember Ford. Here. Mayor Harvey. Here. Okay, so moving on, uh, would you all please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you for that. Then we will be moving on to uh, approval of the minutes and notice of waiving of reading of all resolutions and ordinances introduced and or adopted under this agenda item. And we have one item, which is the meeting minutes from October 10th, 2023. Are there any questions about the minutes from council members? Not seeing any. Um, then I will open this up for public comment. Anyone wishing to have public comment on the meeting minutes from October 10th? Not seeing anyone race up here. Are any hands raised? Kevin, um, could you check with our Zoom attendees? Thank you, Mayor Harvey. Speaking to our Zoom attendees, if you'd like to make a public comment, please use the raise hand icon at this time. Mayor Harvey, that'll end public comment. Okay, thank you so much for that. Then I would be looking for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the less uh, times meetings minutes. I second that motion. <laughs> I have a motion and a second. All in favor, aye. 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 And I'm Mayor Harvey, I'm abstaining because okay. I was not present. Okay, that's fine. So, Kevin, that would be three yeses, one absent, and one abstain. Got it. Okay. See, I can do simple math. Anyways, I'm learning. I'll never be up to your speed, though. <laughs> Anyways, announcements. Uh, meeting orientation for new attendee viewers. In conformance with the Brown Act and the adopted City Council rules, the meeting agenda includes items labeled as action items where the City Council will consider the item and citizens are afforded the opportunity to provide comments relevant to the item being discussed. The meeting agenda also includes a citizen's business item, which is the designated place on the agenda where citizens have the right to say whatever they wish. The City Council may or may not choose to respond to comments as the government code allows. However, if the City Council declines to respond, it should not be perceived as giving credence to or agreeing with any statements that the City Council or its members believe are incorrect, misinformed, or purposely biased. Next, Measure S supports police services, a variety of recreation programs for all ages, and the maintenance of our streets, parks, and public buildings. See details on the web at katadicity.org. Next, citizens interested in receiving City of Katadi community alerts via text or email are encouraged to sign up with Civic Ready by signing up on the city website, www.katadicity.org, under the How Do I link at the top of the homepage. Next, like always, we'd love to hear from you, so please feel free to contact the city at 707-792 4600 or info at org. If you have a non-emergency issue after normal business hours, you can contact us at 707-792-4611. And of course, if you have an emergency, please contact 911. Continue to look for updates on the city's website and social media channels available on Facebook, Instagram, and Civic Ready. Okay, next um, we have proclamations, and our first proclamation is Proclamation of the City Council of the City of Katadi declaring November 2023 as Native American Heritage Month. And Councilmember Ford will be, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> I, 
Sylvia, <laughs> Council Member Sylvia Lemus will be reading that proclamation. Sorry, Sylvia. I think that out of order. Thank you, Mayor Harvey. And I think we have someone here to receive it today. Okay, did you want to come up to the podium as we give the proclamation? Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so we have the proclamation of the City Council of the City of Katati, uh, of the city, declaring November 2023 20, as Native American Heritage Month. Whereas the United States Congress passed Senate Joint Resolution 172 in 1991, which authorizes and requests the President to proclaim November as Native American Heritage Month. And whereas the Coastal Miwok and Southern Pomo are the original people of the land now occupied by the City of Katati. And whereas the City of Katati strives for diversity and acceptance and seeks to uplift and uphold human rights and dignity within its community. And whereas the education acknowledgement of Katati community about coastal Miwok and Southern Pomo tribal histories, culture, and contemporary issues, and the contributions of the coastal Miwok and Southern Pomo people to Sonoma County is vital to the understanding of our origins and rich heritage. And whereas the coastal Miwok and Southern Pomo maintain a harmonious relationship with the ecology of this area, including knowledgeable and respectful harvesting of animals, plants, and mineral resources, and Whereas the traditional cultural and ecological knowledge of the coastal Miwok and Southern Pomo hold important values for our community. And whereas the Katadi community will benefit uh, from the more active and visible input of the native peoples. Now therefore be it proclaimed that November 2023 is Native American Heritage Month in the city of Katadi. And the city council encourages all residents and business owners to participate in making November an occasion for joy, learning, collaboration, and prosperity. Thank you. Chuck, would you like to say anything? Yes. Uh, my name is Jack Pollard. I'm a tribal member at our Brown Valley Indian Tribes in Covalo, California. I'm also the uh, chairman of the Progressive Tribal Alliance here in Sonoma County. Uh, I'd like to say thank you. You know, thank you to Ashley and Damien and to you, uh, Mayor Harvey, for, and, the, and the board and committee to, um, for having this opportunity. It's good, it's great for the community, it's good for the native community to start building relationships with the stakeholders that are out there and the decision makers who, who affect them. Um, yeah, it's just honored to be here and I really appreciate it, thank you. Thank you and we hope that you'll also be able to stay around for one of our other items that's talking about this, um, this also later in the meeting. Um, and would you like a photo up? Sure. Okay. Yeah. We have our professional photographer. Nice. Yes. Thank you for coming. Appreciate okay, it. Really thank you for having me. Thank you very much. Appreciate thank it. Thank you so much for being here. Yes, thank you. Appreciate having me. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, then you have a two minutes. Okay. Do you want to stay in the Yeah. Yes. You're, you're the star. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I do appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'll stick around. Perfect. All right. Thank you. Yeah. And next, we have a proclamation uh, of the City Council of the City of Katadi recognizing October 2023 as National Disability Employment Awareness Month. And this time, Ben, I believe <laughs> it's your turn. This one I'll happily read. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Tiffany Simpson, who is the Service Director for Becoming Independent, one of my favorite Sonoma County nonprofits doing great work in the community. So uh, I'll read the proclamation and invite you to say a few words. A proclamation of the City Council of the City of Katadi recognizing October 2023 as National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Whereas recognition of the contributions of persons with disabilities is an effective way to overcome negative stereotypes and eliminate physical and attitudinal barriers to full participation in all aspects of community life, including education, recreation, and employment, and Whereas people with disabilities are an important, vital part of our community as valued workers, civic leaders, business owners, veterans, family members, and friends, and they are innovative and valued contributors in the workplace, the classroom, and the community. And whereas the city of Katadi 
is committed to ensuring that city programs and employment practices effectively serve and benefit persons of all abilities in order to support individual dignity, self-reliance, and productive lives for all people. And whereas Katadi is proud to renew its dedication to fostering equal access and demonstrating commitment to full inclusion of peoples with disabilities, now therefore be it proclaimed on this 24th of October 2023 by the City Council of the City of Katadi that the month of October 2023 in Katadi is National Disability Employment Awareness Month and encourages all citizens to recognize the accomplishments and contributions of persons with disabilities throughout our community. So welcome, Tiffany. Thank you. I'm honored to be here tonight representing Becoming Independent. Becoming Independent serves adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. The services offered support people through three main fundamentals of living, uh, sorry, of life, living, education, and employment. Each individual gets to choose what services they would like to have, and those services are catered to their level of abilities. In my 13 years at Becoming Independent, my interest has always been focused on employment supports. As the Director of Employment Services, it is with great pleasure that I receive this proclamation and join all of you in celebrating the month of October being National Disability Employment Awareness Month. To share a little history, this recognition began 78 years ago in 1945. It started as only one week long and was limited to the people with physical disabilities. It has been expanded to the full month and acknowledges employment contributions of individuals with all types of disabilities. The theme for this year's Awareness Month is advancing access and equity. When we think of accessibility, we might think of parking spaces and ramps, but we should go much further than that. Access should encompass the removal of barriers, both physical and attitudinal that limit participation of people with disabilities in the workforce. In addition, the theme equity demands fairness. It insists that each person, regardless of their abilities, deserves equal opportunities, rights, and treatment. As we come together to honor this special month, it's important to remember that as advocates for accessibility and equity, we recognize that a disability, visible or not, doesn't reduce the potential of any person. In fact, it adds diversity to our communities, making them rich, vibrant, and resilient. The spirit of Disability Employment Awareness Month is to acknowledge diverse minds and abilities. Our goal is to dismantle stereotypes and misconceptions and replace them with understanding, acceptance, and empathy. Every time a job is created or a barrier is broken down, we're one step closer to a world where each person has the opportunity to thrive, to learn, and to excel. From my professional experience, employees with disabilities are dependable, loyal, and eager to learn. Promoting inclusion in the workplace isn't just the right thing to do. It can improve the quality of an organization and diversify the workforce, which can lead to higher retention rates and employee morale. Although the month of October is quickly coming to an end, I hope that this proclamation will inspire each of you to advocate for accessible workplaces, inclusive policies, and equal opportunities. Please continue to spread awareness of disability employment issues, as well as celebrate the many contributions of workers with disabilities and the businesses who hire them and value them as part of their diverse workforce. We look forward to a day when we no longer need an, aware, an awareness month and this type of equity is built into the fabric of our society. Thank you. Thank you. And I promise next year I'll get on the stick earlier and make this happen before the end of October. Would you like a picture? Oh, yes. All right, thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Which one to look at? <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Thank you. All right, so next we have approval of the final agenda. Do we have changes to the agenda? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I would suggest one change. Um, moving up item 11B, which is a land acknowledgement to um, before citizens' business. So next item. Okay. Does anyone have an issue with that? No? Okay. Then um, I will, this is an action item, so I will um, open this up um, for public comment. Anybody wishing to speak on the movement of the land acknowledgement item up before citizens' business? Not seeing anyone jump up. Can you check with our Zoom attendees, please? Thank you, Mayor Harvey. Speaking to our Zoom attendees, if you'd like to make a public comment on the approval of the final agenda, please use the raise hand icon. Mayor Harvey, that'll end public comment. Okay, thank you for that. Then I guess we will move to um, item now 11B, which is approving a land acknowledgement statement for the city website, a statement for the city council meetings, and resolution updating the council rules. Damien, will you be giving staff a report on this? Yes, um, I will. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. So. Um, this is a um, this item is a land acknowledgement, as the as you had said. In a little bit of history, on October 10th, um, just the previous council meeting, the city council discussed the proposed land acknowledgement, and um, in the staff report on the basically the first and second pages of the staff report is um, is some examples from some nearby jurisdictions, and then um, under the analysis and discussion. There's the, um, the longer version that was proposed at the October 10th meeting. <clears throat> During that meeting um, conversation, there were no, um, uh, no specific uh, further edits to that text. Um, it was proposed, however, though, that although um, in addition to having the, the, the land acknowledgement text um, on the city website also um, placing it in City Hall um, in the council chambers where it's viewable by the public, and then um, furthermore, the council had asked for um, uh, a statement that can be read with each council meeting. So um, in order to accomplish that, we have uh, city council rules that lay out the agenda order and what those um, order, what those order headings are. So um, there's a couple things in this item tonight for the council to consider. One is, and this is on packet page 48 at the bottom of the page, there is a, um, uh, a shorter, you know, something more appropriate for the council packet land acknowledgement, and that's just some proposed proposed text based off the longer version of the text, and then um, and then also the city council rules are attached with the proposed edit, which is a pretty simple edit. It just adds land acknowledgement to the order of the agenda um, immediately following roll call. So. Um, in order to move forward on that, just I would just need confirmation on the um, on the verbiage for the text that will go in the agenda, as well as um, approval of a resolution that would modify the city council rules to insert that item as a standing item in our city council agendas. And um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Um, I just wanted to confirm, we, we already voted for the website, correct, last time? The, um, yeah, I mean, it, that's, that's the appearance that the, the council gave the direction that it seemed fine, and I, um, I thought we would just consolidate it in a single motion so that when we go to look for, you know, um, look for this in the future, it's all in one place. Okay, so it's not an issue to vote twice on the same thing? No. Okay. All right, great. Thank you. Ben, did you have a question? Well, just the, the short version, I'm, I'm happy with it. Um, it's not included in any motion or resolution or anything like that. Um, is that fine? I mean, the, the, all the resolution does is add the line Land, land acknowledgement to the standing agenda, so I'm I'm fine if we're if we're fine just 
sort of approving the sense of the, <laughs> the short version, but do we need to actually vote on that text? I'm not clear. Well, the, yeah, the proposal was motions, um, approval by motions for the, um, the land acknowledgement statement, the long one, which will be on the website as well as City Hall, a separate motion okay. for the statement to be read at City Council meetings, okay. and then the third action being the resolution. Okay. Just a quick question, follow up on that. So the statement, the short statement, will be included in each of the agenda items so that we can read it correctly? Okay. okay. Yeah, it would, there, there would be a new heading on every agenda that would be land acknowledgement after roll call. And then a text will follow. And that there. text verbatim will be there so okay. that the mayor would read it. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, did, did you, was there an opportunity to meet with the folks you met with before to determine that our shorter version was appropriate and that they wanted it? I did um, have an opportunity to discuss it with um, Mr. Pollard and he, um, based on my conversation, I don't want to speak for him, but based on my conversation, it seemed like it was, um, it was acceptable text and okay. appropriate. Okay, I just want to make sure we're not doing it without them. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. Just one more question about, um, the Coast Bee Walk designation um, as this historical Coast Bee Walk territory versus Southern Pomo. Um, I just did you do any work to clarify that? Make sh make sure it's clear. It's I, know, I checked in Prue Draper's book and it says Coast Bee Walk there, but I don't know that she's an, she was an authority on that. So thanks. Yeah. The um, yeah, I, I did. Um, I did speak with uh, Mr. Pollard about it, and um, the basically the response was that Coast Miwok, the city of Katadi is in the ancestral lands of the Coastal Miwok, um, but there's a larger territorial area that the Southern Poma would also come in to this area and use it, but it wasn't the ancestral lands. And the statement explicitly, explicitly says the ancestral lands. So, thank you. No more questions? Okay, then I will open this up for public comment. And Mr. Pollard, would you like to say anything since you worked with Damien on this? I feel like. Yeah. Um, just real quick, we, uh, we did a little bit of our homework. We uh, reached out to the Native community. We talked to with uh, Mr. Dean Hogue. We had a meeting with him. Uh, he is uh, he, he is a community leader for the Native community. He has Coast Miwok. He uh, is very well respected in the community with over 20 years service to the, um, to the Natives. He currently is over at Skip right now. But uh, So we did our homework, and yes, we, uh, we, I believe we have the right verbiage, um, and everything is fine with him. Yeah. Any questions? No? Yeah, I just want to say thank you for your work on that. I definitely want to make sure you're included. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And I appreciate you working with Damien so that we get this, you know, we get this right and we get it. Um, and this is a really good example of what you brought up when we did the proclamation of working together. So really appreciate that. Uh, any other comments on this item? Not seeing anyone else jump up. Um, Kevin, can you check with those on Zoom? Thank you, Mayor Harvey. Speaking to our Zoom attendees, please use the raise hand icon if you'd like to make a public comment on this item. Mayor Harvey, that'll end public comment. Okay, so I will bring this back to the council and would be looking for a motion. Um, I move that we approve the um, addition of this text to our land acknowledgement to our agenda and also to our city website. Can I ask that we also add posting in City Hall to that? Oh, yes, and posting to City Hall and anywhere else that deems appropriate. Yeah. It, and we also need it, it a resolution. Just, okay, so where should I be reading it's this It's on from? the paragraph Right under the recommendation. Um, yeah. and, and, an alternative would just be to approving the staff recommendations, okay. everything that's in there. Can you just tell me the page number? The page, page 46. Um, the page 46. Number. On it. Yeah. Okay, so I'm sorry. So the, the it has to be the, the recommendation is what I yeah. should read? Okay. Yeah. So I move <laughs> that we approve the recommendation to adopt 
uh, approving the land acknowledgement statement to be publicly displayed on the city website and in city hall. Approve a separate statement to be read at regular city council meetings and the resolution approving the indicated changes to the city council rules. I'll second. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? We'll let that show a four with one absent. Thank you for that. All right. So let me see if I can figure out where we are at. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are now at Citizens Business. So, Citizens Business and public comment for consent calendar items. Any member of the public wishing to speak to the council on any items listed on the consent calendar or any matters not listed on the agenda that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council may do so at this time. Pursuant to the Brown Act, the council is not allowed to consider issues or take action on any items not listed on the agenda during this period. Pursuant to City Council Policy 2021-01, comments of any member of the public are normally restricted to a total of three minutes in length per person for matters not on the agenda and a total of three minutes per person in length for any and all items on the consent calendar. Uh, with that, anyone in the public wishing to speak on the consent calendar items or public comment? Not seeing anyone jump up already. Then Kevin, could you check with our Zoom audience? Thank you, Mayor Harvey. Speaking to our Zoom attendees, please use the raise hand icon if you would like to make a public comment for Citizens Business. Mayor Harvey, that'll end public comment. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, then I would, ooh. and we have no consent calendar. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, wait, there is no consent calendar, right? <laughs> Thank you for that. So we will move on then. Uh, so there's nothing to vote on for that. Uh, just to be clear for the audience, uh, we will move on to direction on future agenda items. Yes, Kay. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on a few that I've been asking for. So the um, a review of term limits for city council members and um, uh, looking at the, uh, I believe it was, wasn't called, was it called citizen oversight for police, the committee that did exist before about reinstating that now that COVID, well, it's not gone, but it's better. Um, and then the third thing was, um, uh, discussions about um, the library, about having a library in Katagi. Anyone else? Okay. Then um, we will move on to public hearings. And the first one um, that we have is adoption of an interim urgency ordinance extension prohibiting the conversion of senior mobile home parks. And Damien, are you going to take this item? Yes, thank you, Mayor, members of the Council. So um, just brief, uh, brief background for anyone that's not familiar that might be listening to the meeting. Um, the Countryside Mobile Home Park here in Katati, um, uh, this is, this is a, our only senior mobile home park that's within the city. The owners of Countryside sent the mobile home park owners a notice of a meeting regarding proposed amendment to the park rules and regulations back on July, it was dated on July 26th. Uh, 2023 and um, this was sort of the start of this conversation and um, the owner held a meeting with the residents to read the rules to them and um, and the main change that was the issue that we've been talking about since then was the um, change from a senior only park to an all age park so um, on September 12th of this year, the City Council unanimously adopted Interim Urgency Ordinance Number 922, which temporarily prohibits conversions of senior mobile home parks into all-age mobile home parks. And then um, furthermore, on October 10th, the City Council reviewed and issued a report on measures taken to alleviate conditions that led to the adoption of the Urgency Ordinance. Um, and then 
the urgency ordinance that was originally adopted on September 12th under state statute is effective for f up to 45 days, for 45 days. And um, one of the, um, uh, so we're, well, we're getting close to that 45 day time period. So um, as we said in, on, on October 10th in that report to council, we've been working on um, a solution to the issue, more of a long-term solution. And this is the senior overlay that, um, that we're also working on in parallel, but we're not gonna be done within 45 days of the adoption of the initial urgency ordinance, obviously. So um, what's before you tonight is an extension to that um, urgency ordinance. So it is, um, it is unchanged from that original um, adopted urgency ordinance with one exception. And that is um, the original urgency ordinances for 45 days, and this one is um, is extended to um, 20, 22 months and 15 days, which is the the statutory limit for an extension on an urgency ordinance, unless it's superseded by an overlay of the permanent ordinance that we've been talking about. And um, by extending the existing interim urgency ordinance, it'll just simply continue. Uh, temporarily continue the status quo while staff finishes its our work on the um, on the overlay ordinance and we'll keep the, it's intended to keep the senior park a senior park while the overlay ordinance is being worked on and being discussed it's going to come to the planning commission as well as the council um, in the future so um, that is it, like I said, the urgency ordinance itself is essentially identical to the earlier one adopted by the council, except for the time frame has been extended out to give staff additional time to finish the overlay ordinance. And um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions, if there are any. Questions? I just have one for Mr. Bacher. In that, in that section three effective date, it, it says, shall take effect immediately upon reading in full and passage by does that mean we have to read it out loud in full? Or just that we've each read it in full? No. It, it could mean that, but at the beginning of the meeting, you waive a uh, reading okay. of the ordinance. So okay, that's what you. most jurisdictions, well, most jurisdictions don't do it the way you do it. They have the motion include waiving the reading. How about you waive the reading at the beginning of the okay, meeting? Okay, thank you. I'm happy to read it. No, that's, <laughs> that's okay. Yes. Um, I was just uh, wondering if there were any updates that you could share since the last uh, time we approved the update. Uh, sure. So um, one one update, and I was going to talk about this later in the meeting under the city manager report, but I could talk about it now. Is um, is we had um, uh, planning or community development staff met with um, the residents of the Countryside Mobile Home Park on October seventeenth. Um, to hear concerns and discuss the um, mobile home park senior overlay ordinance. And the meeting was well attended and it was appreciated by um, the residents that came. And then the uh, mobile home senior overlay ordinance will be presented to the planning commission for a recommendation to the city council. Um, the plan date for that planning commission meeting is November 6th. So that's um, coming up shortly. And um, interested members of the community are invited to attend or provide their comments to the project planner. And that's um, Autumn Bus. She's the project planner for that, for that ordinance. And then um, we do anticipate that the initial reading of the ordinance um, uh, provided, the count, or provided the planning commission um, approves, approves the recommendation to council. Um, the initial reading is planned at the city council for November 28th. So that's the schedule it's on currently. Okay, and that would be the one that we would then discuss and potentially approve it so that it's no longer an urgent interim one, correct? Right, the, the urgency ordinance is really just um, sort of a, to hold things right. static until we have a conversation about um, the overlay ordinance. And okay. that's, that's, that would be the forum, the planning commission and the council meetings to have the conversation about is this something, you know, is this how we want, it to, how, how we want to solve the urgency issue. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, then um, I will open this up, uh, the public hearing up on this item. Anyone wishing to speak on this item? I would only wish what? that everyone Could was speaking to the mic. I, I'm 
new and I live in the mobile home park, Marty Kishuba, not the same one. And I'm very supportive and I hope Sierra Mobile Home will be supportive. Um, but this is my first meeting and I would just ask you all to really lean into your mic. You did a couple times so I could catch some of what you were saying and that would be, I'd be most appreciative. And thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Uh, anyone else wishing to speak? Not seeing anyone else. Could we check with our Zoom attendees? Thank you, Mayor Harvey. Speaking to our Zoom attendees, please use the raise hand icon if you'd like to make a public comment on this item. Mayor Harvey, that'll end public comment. Okay, then I will close the public hearing on this and would be looking for a motion. <laughs> was that was that look because we traumatized you on the last one? I'm happy to move an extension to an uncodified interim urgency ordinance of the Council of the City of Katati prohibiting the conversion of senior mobile home parks with an uh, extension to, for a period of effect of 22 months and 15 days. I second that motion. All right, I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any no's? Opposed? Any abstains? Let that show as a four one absent. Okay, thank you for that. Then we will move on to our regular agenda. And the first item we have there is authorized signing a joint support letter for the Sonoma Water Proposal for Pacific Gas and Electric Company draft license surrender application uh, of the Potter Valley project. And okay, Craig. Gee, you don't know anything about this, do you? I'll take this <laughs> one. We'll, we'll see. Um, Mayor, members of the council, Craig Scott, city engineer, uh, public works director. The city of Katadi is a wholesale water contractor. Um, we get our wholesale water from uh, Sonoma Water um, and th through an agreement along with city of Santa Rosa, city of Sonoma, Petaluma, um, and others. And um, we have representation um, on monthly meetings with Sonoma Water to talk water issues through a water advisory committee or a WAC. And um, Council Member Sparks is our current chair or um, a member representative on that committee. Uh, it also has a technical advisory committee or TAC, which is attended every other month by staff. Okay, so that's kind of the background for this. Um, the the item before us tonight is um, there's a lot of uh, conversation or, or a lot of issues going on with this this Potter Valley project. Okay, and the Sonoma Water has taken some action along with others to submit a proposal and. Uh, just in general, our action tonight is to provide direction to our WAC member on whether or not to um, support and sign on to this joint letter that will be uh, sent by the WAC to our state and federal legislative representatives. Okay. Um, there are a lot of acronyms in this presentation. I'll uh, we'll try to uh, spell them out as we come across them. So the Potter Valley Project was formed back in uh, 2008 by some private entrepreneurs looking for energy generation facility up in the northern, uh, up in Mendocino County. And they were taking advantage of a 475 foot drop between the Eel River and Sonoma or uh, Russian River watersheds and uh, had the idea of digging a tunnel, lining it with redwood, and uh, through that um, potential energy with the water dropping 475 feet to generate power and stimulate economic growth 
uh, et cetera, up there. And sort of a side benefit of that was the water supply that came through the power plant. And so the Potter Valley Irrigation District formed and agricultural communities up there, City of Ukiah, Cloverdale, others. Um, it was a real boon for them just from this one hydroelectric power plant. Um, and it was owned and operated by several different uh, utilities until 1930 when PG&E took it over. And they operated under a um, Federal Energy Regulation Commission FERC license. Okay, and um, so that just describing the project, initially it was started with just a, a very small dam at the electric power plant. And they found that it was very limiting because they could only use, they could only uh, maximize the power plant energy production for a very short period of time and with late, um, uh, late spring or late, late winter and early spring rains. And then it just dropped off precipitously and the power plant just kind of sat there and almost idled for the rest of the year. And so then the impetus came along to build Scott Dam, uh, form Lake Pillsbury, and that provided a more regulated uh, or availability of flow through this. And that was also a welcome benefit to the irrigation district and others. Um, so this Potter Valley project collectively is the, the Lake Pillsbury with Scott Dam, Van Arnsdale, which is the, the, the dam around the hydroelectric plant, the tunnel itself, the hydroelectric facility, all the licenses that go along with it. There's a water per, uh, li, uh, permit or um, water right, a power right, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so everything was humming along, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, from 1930, and then uh, is benefiting Lake Lake Mendocino as those water that water would come and fill Lake Mendocino, and provide some water supply reliability. And over the decades, it would form this benefit for fish as well for the environment and the Russian River watershed. It came to rely on on that those extra additional flows. Um, and uh, so there's some background in the staff report as to the, the, the system, the conveyance use of the Russian River and the Lake Mendocino and Lake Sonoma dams to meet uh, regulatory required minimum flows in the Russian River, okay? And so Lake Mendocino would help meet those minimum flows and then help uh, sort of preserve water in Lake Sonoma to a certain extent so that they could then, um, the releases from that reservoir, that dam would then provide for lower river minimum flows. Okay, um, so there's some benefit that has been realized by the Russian River from this hydroelectric facility. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Um, I think it's helpful at this point to talk about the timeline. I mentioned from 1930, PG&E took it over under a FERC license. Well, in 2016, PG&E realized that the FERC license would expire in April of 2022. So in 2016, PG&E started um, having meetings with interest group stakeholders as to uh, this bringing them in to the relicensing process. What would this relicense look like? Would it have any change, different provisions in it? Um, Sonoma Water was engaged in that, and it was just kind of almost routine at that point. Then there was a bombshell in 2018, because PG&E all of a sudden changed their tune. They went from, oh, we're gonna relicense. I think they realized that they were losing money every year to the tune of about $3 million a year on this hydro plant. They weren't, the revenues generated were not covering the expenses of this aging infrastructure, right? So in 2018, they said, hey, we announced, they announced its intention to surrender the FERC license. And that got everybody's attention, especially Sonoma Water. Um, 
and others because uh, cessation of the hydro plant would potentially stop the diversions. Um, and so there was this, uh, a lot of things happened in 2018 at that time. Uh, Jared Huffman uh, began this two basin solution partnership, bringing in all the different interests from neighboring counties to look at what the, uh, a two basin solution would look like, two basins being Eel River and Russian River, um, what it would look like beyond the, the delicensing, decommissioning of the hydro plant. And so what came out of that was this run of the river, this idea of, hey, if we're uh, satisfying the, the fish benef benefits to the habitat and the migration, these dams would need to go, but we would still recognize the benefit to meeting some water supply needs. And so this, what came out of that partnership over the next ensuing four or five years was this two basin solution. Hey, there's, there's a solution there that's going to make both satisfy both basins, you know, um, main, main needs. Um, at the same time as that, Sonoma Water said, hey, we want to have an ear to what's so the contractors are the the TAC members, the WAC, you know, our our, our water contractors, us, so Santa Rosa, so forth, wanted an ear to what's going on with PG and E and FERC. Wanted to kind of see what's how that decommissioning process is developing. So we had these meetings over the last four or five years, um, and uh, so that started about 2018 as well. Okay, so going to the next, we got uh, fall of 2022, so the next slide, please. Um, the uh, Water Agency secured a $2 million grant from Department of Water Resources to do um, a few things. One was to convene the stakeholder group, this Russian River Water Forum, and we've heard about that through um, other, through um, updates that uh, Council Member Sparks has provided us. Early on in that, the the prior uh, WAC member, uh, Council Member uh, Harvey, and I were interviewed by Sonoma Water as to who do we think the stakeholder, who, who do you think should be involved in the water forum, and what should the primary objectives be, and um, what are your major concerns? So that was all provided and to them, and, and this water forum came to be. And in May of 2023, the first planning group met, and it had fishery representatives, tribal representatives, uh, the irrigation and agricultural representatives, urban water supplier, all on that. Um, and that's been going on since for from May to present day, and it's. Um, expect it to come to an end at the end of this year. So there's talk of a leadership council or group being formed. That's not going to happen. I think they're running out of money, and it, it, it's um, a lot of benefit has come out of it, but it, it's, it's kind of seeing uh, coming to an end. The importance of that is um, right around... Uh, um, June, July, the water forum is going full steam, and PG&E is telling uh, Sonoma Water and others that um, we we are on this track with FERC to submit a um, a surrender and decommissioning plan. And, and they told us that January 1st, 2025, we are going to need to have a final plan and then we implement it. And you know, then they start moving forward to decommission Scott Dam and all, all of that, right? Um, but we need this proposal in July. We need an alternative. Uh, if, you're, if you're planning uh, water suppliers and fisheries and tribes to, uh, wanting to keep the diversion open, you're going to need to 
give us your proposal. Give us a proposal of what that's going to look like. And it can't interfere with our process. We want out. We want to finish, you know, extract ourselves from this process and then just walk away from it. And so, but we are open to having an alternative proposal that keeps the diversion or whatever your interests are. Um, so that was submitted in July. So here you have this water, Russian River water form going on. And then it was kind of a surprise that the Round Valley Indian tribe, the Mendocino Water and Power, I'm not getting their name right, uh, um, district uh, and Sonoma Water submitted this proposal in July. But I think what happened was, and a lot of people believe this is the deadline that pg e sprung on them was so quick that they didn't have a lot of time to like involve many parties in that decision. Um, so that was fairly recent in July that that happened. Um, and that is the proposal that was submitted by these three entities to pg e that we are being asked to uh, sign on to a joint letter to support that proposal. So that proposal is, just want to make sure I get this right, um, it's to one, form a joint entity that is going to um, first negotiate and work with pg &E on on what existing facility, facilities are going to be made kept you know kept as part of this new diversion option um, what uh, what the new f facilities are going to look like you know and it's going to and uh, Remember, pg e is already is on the hook for taking down Scott Dam and taking, you know, decommissioning the system. So we're not alleviating them of those responsibilities, but we are providing a new new options for what this new facility is going to look like, and it's going to be very fish friendly. You know, fish are going to be able to migrate uh, past the hydro plant. And then they're going to be able to migrate even higher past where Scott Dam would have been. So, um, and then uh, provide for d uh, continued diversions. So first, and it's on packet page 21, where there's the item proposal, creation of a regional entity, um, request pg &E, uh, include in its final license surrender and decommission application, this proposal. Um, and then it provides several concept options on the proposed Eel River facility. And it's a it's a 12 page proposal, which is also attached um, to the staff report. It starts on page uh, packet page 26. Um, it's got the the main purposes of the regional entity to be formed by the end of this year. Um, it has a table there of the, um, the, the, the existing component, uh, facilities to be maintained, new facilities, modifications of facilities, et cetera. Uh, and it talks about, I think, um, a couple different options for the, yeah, two different options for how the pump, mainly around the pump station at where Van Arnsdale Dam is on how that's going to work. There's one that's passive that just lets the water flow by gravity and there's one that actually is pumped out through these rainy collectors uh, which don't exist right now. They would be part of the new solution. And then there's uh, pictures, aerial photos, pictures. Uh, these are concept designs of how this would work. Um, so Sending something off to PG&E is like you know, sending something off into the dark. But about a, few, a couple of weeks ago, they did reply um, with a communication saying, uh, 
PG announced that it has made a non-binding acceptance in concept of the Sonoma County, Sonoma Water, Mendocino County Inland Water and Power Commission and Round Valley Indian Tribes proposal and agrees to include it in their November 15th, 2023 initial draft and surrender application and decommissioning plan. So that's good news. We heard that they're open to considering the proposal. Good, that, that's a good slide to see on this. Um, so next, next month, November, is the initial draft, and then in May of 2024 will be the final draft, and then the, the date I mentioned early on here is January 1st, 2025, FERC wants the final decommissioning surrender plan. So this is the process for which it'll happen, and uh, the, the proposal, it looks to be on track, it is to be included in this timeline. All right, a uh, lot to digest here. Uh, next sl slide, please. Okay, so um, the the impact of no diversions. Okay, so let's say PG&E did their decommissioning in the absence of any other proposal. So. 10, 20, 30 years from now, the diversion would stop. Dams would be decommissioned. That's the kind of timeline we're looking at, 20, 30 years. Um, and it would stop. And then somebody would could come along, certainly after that, and kind of see what they can do to get it started. But that would be, it would it'd leave this indeterminate amount of time in between there where it would we'd be experiencing no diversions. Okay, so there's, that's always an option, but this is like we want to seamlessly have the diversions continue, is what this proposal is trying to achieve. Um, uh, having no diversion is typically characterized as um, the uh, impacts to Lake Mendocino. Uh, so water shortages would be estimated to be happen in eight out of 10 years and predicted to go dry 50% of the time, one out of two years. The, um, I don't know where this estimate comes from, but the economic losses are estimated to be in the tens of millions. I would think proportionally, disproportionately to the upper river area. Um, the process could take uh, 20 to 30 years um, to decommission it. Uh, the dam, uh, I'm not sure what these other bullets are. Um, Oh yeah, so um, okay, so let's let's move on to the next slide. And that talks about the proposal and next steps if the proposal is ex accepted. Um, we would go ahead and form the JPA, um, convene a table that is basically have a seat at the table to negotiate this acquisition um, of the project from PG&E, work out those terms, um, figure out who's going to pay for it, what the costs are and who's going to pay for it. Um, uh, the term I was looking for was a purchase and sale agreement. And then, uh, and then go ahead and design, design and do the, make the modifications to, for that new diversion facility. All right, next slide, please. So before January 25th, obviously all of these things have to, would have to come together, um, forming the regional entity and, and identifying the financial, uh, the finances, the payment of these, uh, the new funding, the capital facilities and the annual operating costs of that. Right now, the, the interim regional entity we're talking about uh, is could be an interim entity just to negotiate the acquisition purchase and sale agreement and then the actual long-term ownership regional entity could be another entity the the TAC membership is promoting that the county be on the JPA not 
the water agency because the county is actually the has a representation in that north Sonoma County area where Sonoma Water doesn't. And TAC pointed that out to Sonoma Water uh, quite a few times. Um, you, it makes sense for the county to be there because they've got the representation. They're representing um, Cloverdale and agricultural landowners and so forth uh, that are up there. Um, okay, so final slide. We have another slide um, there. Basically, the, at this point, I, I, I haven't mentioned this yet, but um, I did ask this at, at one of the TAC meetings was, hey, does this commit us? Just entering in the proposal commit the Sonoma Water and the contractors to moving forward, regardless of the costs and the entanglements that the regulatory entanglements that are additional to what we do now, um, not knowing the benefits we get to the project. And um, Sonoma Water staff has told us this is a, keeping a foot in the door. There's many off ramps to come. This is not a commitment for following through all the way with this project. It's just keeping that diversion uh, door open for us right now. Okay, so the recommendation again is to receive the presentation and to provide our WAC representative, um, Ms. Sparks, direction on um, so, uh, the city signing on to the joint letter supporting the proposal. Thank you. Questions? Um, so, so all the questions I have sound like they would be answered by the interim entity that's going to be created, like uh, where, well, so a couple were, you know, who's going to run it, who's going to pay for it. So that would be the interim uh, entity that would determine that piece. Is that correct? The interim entity will um, get us to that point. And even so the, the purchase and sale, and sale agreement, agreement would be their charge. And then some other entity would come along after that, which could be very similar. Um, to actually operate it. Okay, and and this entity, do, are there any parameters around what that is or who would be included? Right now, it's those three entities, uh, Sonoma Water, the Mendocino Power Commission, and the Round Valley Indian Tribes. Um, I think from what I've heard, the county, uh, we were listened to and heard, and the county is going to be I'm part of one of the entities. And by county, do you mean Mendocino or no, Sonoma, Sonoma or Lake? Sonoma it's... County. Okay. Okay. Yeah, those were my main questions. Thank you. Go ahead, then. I just want to make sure, Craig, that I've got this, and I'm understanding this right. So if, if PG&E does not include this uh, combined Sonoma water, Mendocino, Water, Brown Valley Tribe um, proposal in their decommissioning proposal, then then the decommissioning process is entirely between PG&E and FERC, and there are no local players at the table. Is that approximately correct? I believe that's true. Um, it would, they would be in their sole objective would be to stop the power and decommission the power plant, and that would just be the end of that. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, I know that we got a number of letters from the public, and I had a question about um, at what point would there be engagement on the protection of fisheries and the ecosystem in the river? That is part and parcel to this entire effort starting. Um, it, it was it really emphasized 
in the Jared Huffman Two Basins Solution Partnership effort, and it carried forward in the Russian River Water Forum effort, which has a wide uh, stakeholder representation with fisheries, uh, Friends of the Eel River, um, uh, as well as agriculture and water suppliers. There's a wide range of interests being represented and, and in pulled into these discussions. Um, it uh, in this day and age, I mean the well, I shouldn't say that the the new project will be regulated by uh, the National Marine Fisheries, uh, you know, NIMPS service. Uh, it will be. Um, regulated by the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, by the Department of Water Resources. So all of those agencies look for a balance between the supply need and um, maintaining the health of the environment and the fisheries. And then you've got the Indian tribes in there as well that have their uh, critical deal um, must have stipulations, which are a viable uh, fish habitat and harvestable and and can bring it back to the way as much as possible to the way it was before all these projects these dams and so forth so to state that another way um, right now uh, it, it sits under FERC as you said because it's considered to be all about electricity so once FERC kind of uh, is done with pg and &E and bows out, then it becomes a different animal, and which is what Craig's saying, then it falls under a different agency. Because originally, when they were going through uh, the process with pg and &E and Jared Huffman's group and all that, they were looking to take over that license and would have had to to um, deal with FERC. But I, that kind of went away, and so now it, it's becoming, well, what can we do instead? And it sounds like um, there's, some, there's some examples in here. So it, it does put the who's looking at it and what they're looking at it in a very different spot by having it under the, the fisheries. Uh, and so it would be anything that's done will be different. So. Um, I, Two, there was the letters there, and I think that um, it seemed like a lot of it, were, since it was repeated in all of them, I think it was kind of a form letter. And so I just kind of wanted to um, highlight some of the things in there. Um, it says that it appears that it's largely about water diversions, and when I, um, and, and little about how it um, benefits um, the Eel River tribes and communities. And that, that, when you look at what's actually in there, it talks very much about the project and it says the facility will be designed for upstream and downstream fish migration with the goal of achieving naturally reproducing self-sustaining and harvestable native andromedoids fish populations, and then it goes on to say, fish migration and eel river diversions in the selected design will be on conditions mutually agreeable to the proponents that protect the fishing rights and water rights of the Round Valley Indian tribes. So very much those are taken into consideration, and um, apparently whoever wrote this kind of didn't catch that, so I wanted to get that. Um, it also talks about the cost burden of any future diversion project must not be unfairly allocated and how those costs are shared needs to be clear and transparent. And um, Craig will attest to this because this has been going on for quite some time. That has been the stance of um, the water contractors, um, you know, of which we are one um, since this has been going on. That we really do not want to um, pay for anything more than uh, what is commiserate to the benefit that we're receiving. And we have said that for uh, however long this has been going on, five or, <laughs> five or six years. So that drum has been beat many, many times. So um, yes, um, we, are, we are aware of that, and anybody involved has, has been um, very, um, very loudly stating that. So, 
And then lastly, um, it says if Russian River water users are as reliant on an out of basin diversion as this letter suggests, um, it's concerning. And it's not that, um, that they're reliant on it. And I can't remember exactly the words that, that you used, Damien, because you said it nicely. Um, and it's more of a um, reliability. It's another source in the chain. And so, so just having that, you know, backstop there. So it's not that we're reliant as shown on, on the picture, we do get, we get most of our water uh, uh, from either our groundwater or we get it from Lake Sonoma. But it's nice to have that reliability and backstop. Um, it's really much more important to um, those upstream, you know, as was stated. I think in the letter um, it said that there are, uh, it's drinking supply water for more than 97,000 people in the upriver communities. So they're really, you know, upriver of, of Lake Sonoma. Um, so it just really makes ours more reliable in case we need that backstop. And um, as far as um, the, the fish, in the letter it does state the proposed new eel, eel Russian facility would provide for effective and timely fish migration past the new diversion facilities while allowing water to be transferred to the Russian River when flows are high enough in the Eel River. So, so it is considering that. So in the letter it sounded like uh, the fish were, were not being addressed and, and I believe that, that that is addressed in this letter. So I think I hit everything in the letters, the, the questions that we got um, from folks. So any other questions? Yes, okay. Um, so uh, the one thing I saw in the letter that really jumped out to mm -hmm. me was, and um, Craig, so my question to you is, I, I see that this, you know, was sent July 31st and then updated on August 3rd. So I don't know if it's, you know, signing on to it if we're allowed to make suggestions or if it's, you know, kind of a done deal. But if if we are, um, I agree that there is a lot of uh, detail about the fish and the diverting of the water. But I do see the purpose of this one. Um, statement that they asked to be added. This, um, any diversions of stream low, stream flow from the Eel River to the Russian River should be only of a time and magnitude that maintains the ecological integrity of the Eel River. And I, I agree, I would like to see that added. If it's, is, is it something that we can request or how, how is that, how is the, what is the process for that? I think, I think the group would argue that that's already in in the letter, and that's in the process uh, to safeguard that, that, that as being one of the primary objectives. Um, this is a joint letter, and with a very short turnaround time, I think it has to be, to be submitted by November 3rd. So, um, I mean, it, that specific suggestion is um, is already incorporated into that process. Like it, the, the solution is not going to um, disregard. It, it, it's the solution is going to incorporate the health of the Eel River ecology. Um, I, I think, and yeah. I'll just, yeah, I'll just add. I mean, the, just I think the short answer is that some governing bodies have already approved the letter. Mm -hmm. Others are still to do it. So it's it's either we do it or don't, or we don't do it. Yeah. Okay. Terms of signature. Yeah. yeah. So, so there's no, there really is an opportunity to make a suggestion like this. Not, no, not for this letter. Okay. No. All right. Thank you. And and Kay, I I think part of what co covers that, you know, is that sentence was a little unclear to me, but I think what what correlates to it is the sentence in the letter that says the proposed new eel. Russian facility would provide for effective and timely fish migration past the new diversion facilities while allowing water to be transferred to the Russian River when flows are high enough in the Eel River. So, so I think that that generally covers exactly um, what they're talking to 
you know, be of the time and, and the magnitude um, to ensure that ecological integrity. I, I and, think that that's Mayor, the intention I, there. I, I will add just generally in terms, I think this is what Craig was alluding to or getting to, was that, um, <clears throat> so, I, you know, I wouldn't kid ourselves if this project goes forward, it's gonna be probably very expensive and it's going to be just as much of a fisheries project as it is a water supply project. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you touch the, as soon as you touch the river, um, the resource agencies, you're in their world, you know. And so it's going to be, um, yeah, it's going to be very expensive, and it's going to have to be protective of fisheries because that's just how things are these, you know, these days. It's not early 1900s when this diversion was originally set up, and um, you know, a, a good example is. Right now, as the mayor said, we get um, most of our water from Lake Sonoma. And um, because we're the water contract, when I say we, the water contractors are using the river to convey water from the lake to the point of diversion, um, <clears throat> that was the leverage that the resource agencies needed to enter into a biological, basically study the river system because of the threatened and endangered species in that system and issue a biological opinion, which basically puts all of us collectively on the hook for all of those um, fixes to the river. So the dry creek um, improvements, um, the flow regimes, there's, um, so basically, you know, um, we own the Russian river <laughs> at this point, you know, and uh, one thing, one thing I will just also say, which I think is maybe worth pointing out is that while, at least in my mind, it's the jury's still out on if ultimately this would be something that we would want to participate in as water contractors, because there's a lot of variables still that need to be um, questions need to be answered. Variables that are out there, cost being one of them, cost allocation. How would this thing actually work? What would be our benefit, right? And um, uh, so, I, but I think you know, I, but I think it. I think at this stage in the game, it's there's more potential benefit to being included in the conversation than there is to not, and um, that's why, at least at this point in time, this point in the process, that, that's why the recommendation is to just to sign on, just to continue the engagement in this process, and um, and, and to something that Mayor Harvey said in terms of cost being proportional. They, um, <clears throat> I mean, that's the ultimate backstop is legally we're required to make sure that anything we pay for is proportional to the benefit. Um, I mean, hopefully it doesn't get into some sort of legal challenge at the end. Hopefully there's another, you know, more friendly off-ramp along the way, and there should be, but but there, there's always that backstop too. Um, so anyway, but I'll just leave it at that in case you guys have more questions. I have one question for Craig. So Craig, you mentioned that the County of Sonoma is wanting to also sign on. So since, is that what you said? Yes, and that um, the JPA is working out their bylaws and, and rules and voting and everything just like we did with the GSA um, right now. And um, the county is looking to be a member of that interim agency. So put another way, are we looking like it's gonna be like the groundwater where they get two seats? I, I can't I uh, I can't yeah, speak to that I don't know enough if, okay. if Sonoma if, if the Sonoma County is going to take the place of Sonoma water okay or you if, don't know that I don't know that okay no. all right but that's a really good question <laughs> well yeah because that always ends up being an item of, of, of contention but yeah I mean um, it, it, we had we had to fight like pretty hard and Craig will attest to this to kind of be included to kind of know um, what's going on. So <laughs> we've made leaps and bounds. So kind of staying in and knowing what um, what is going on, you know, to your point, Damien, I think really benefits us in the long run um, to kind of keep a seat at the at the table because for a very long time, PG&E has been pretty secretive behind closed doors and wouldn't share anything with anybody. So. <laughs> Uh, good to be at the table, at least. And, and Mayor, if I might add, the, the one, one other thing, I slipped my mind, but I thought I'd just say it, because it is another potential benefit, but it, sees, it just depends on how this all plays out. 
is that um, right now the water contractors, which are the water contractors to the water agency, are, um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they kind of own the river system and they fund all the biological opinion work, you know, all the monitoring, all the, you know, fishery work, all the um, stream restoration stuff, in addition to grants, but it, we're the responsible party. Um, there's a lot of other users on the river that are sort of outside the process. They don't, they don't participate in the process. They don't contribute to the process. Um, and I'm talking, you know, uh, there's other uh, cities along the river that are not water contractors, you know. So, you know, cities like, um, you know, Healdsburg, Cloverdale, Windsor, Occidental, I think, um, you know, uh, Guerneville, I think they have, anyway, they have their water supply near the river as well. But, and then there's agricultural users up and down the river. There's a lot of different participants. So on your groundwater, on your GSA analogy, um, there could be some parallels here too, where like we all need to get together and try to um, make the river system better. Um, and everyone should participate, not just a small group of people, is how it, how it is working right now. There's a small group of contractors that are basically responsible for everything and a bunch of people outside the process that kind of do whatever they've been doing historically. So, um, you know, by potentially creating this, a, a JPA that manages it overall, it, it could be a, um, a, f a vehicle to bring more people, more entities into the, into the process for the betterment of the river systems overall. So um, just anyway, just a point I thought I'd make that in a, you know, in a, in a good scenario, that would be one of the potential outcomes. And Kay, for your benefit, just know that um, when they had the previous group, it, the things you bring up like uh, who's managing it and the funding, that tended to be some of the rub areas when they tried to perform uh, it under Jared Huffman's um, group. Because it, it's complicated and as Damian pointed out, there's a lot of people that are used to not contributing. Um, so. It's complicated. <laughs> so any other questions? Okay, um, then I will open this up for public comment. Anyone wishing? Yes, Neil. Yes, hello, Council. Um, thank you very much for hearing this and for your information. I spent most of my Sunday um, writing this letter and talking to some experts about what was a good way of phrasing it because if you just look at fish migration, you know, if you fish past, you tick a box. If you look at the ecological integrity of the system, it's a much bigger picture. And I think practically speaking, that is what will happen with the agencies. And really what I'm coming to you to sort of highlight is, would you be on board for really emphasizing that ecological integrity of the system? The discussion this evening here is all about us I don't think we own the Russian River. I think it's part out there for the system to actually be used. So um, it's actually pretty interesting that the annual Salmonid Restoration Conference, the 41st version, 41st version of this, is coming to Santa Rosa next year, March 26th to 29th. There's a lot of biologists there that talk about things. I think this evening we're really hearing about the, the lawyers and the engineers saying how this system works. And the practical side is we do live in a Mediterranean climate. The storms can be massive. There is a possibility that we can harvest water or water can be transferred, but it's will the ecological conditions be used as the highest priority? And I don't know the mechanism for that, but I certainly think that should be emphasized to the WAC who's consult, um, representative who's not here this evening. Um, I would I'd identify that, um, you know, in the press release, Bill Whipper, president, board, president of the Round Valley Indian Tribe, has said they're on board to restore the Eel River watershed from its degraded condition and to restore our salmonary fishery, fishery to sustainable and harvestable populations. So they're certainly in there to support it. The easiest way to do this is just take out the dams and not do any water transfers. That would maintain a lot of the ecological integrity because there wouldn't be any gods and goddesses playing in there to transfer it. But the experts do see, and the fishery people do see that there's, you know, there's a lot of water in California if we can just pick it in the right phases. 
just putting in a pipe and taking it out like it has been done in the past for, um, for the 100 years for the, for the electricity generation has degraded it at times. So I'd bring you up, to, I would, I'd identify also that sadly from recent studies by UC Davis Center for Watershed Sciences, State of the Salmonids, it concludes that California will lose more than half of its native Andronomus salmonids and a third of its inland fish in the, fifth, in the next 50 years under current conditions. So are we talking about raising this bar to look at the ecological context in there? The current conditions are already appalling. So um, I think I've got to my limit here, but I would ask you just to consider those ecological conditions as the next step up generally. And I don't know how we actually communicate that. It will be ongoing, but I think it would be valuable for Katati to communicate that as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? Not seeing anyone jump up. Could we go to our Zoom attendees? Thank you, Mayor Harvey. Speaking to our Zoom attendees, if you'd like to make a public comment on this item, please use the raise hand icon at this time. Mayor Harvey, that'll end public comment. Okay, then I will bring it back and, yes. Well, I'll start just by saying I agree with, uh, with Neil that I, I wish the language in the agreement was more about e ecological integrity than simply fish passage, which is, I think, a pretty good marker for ecological integrity of the river system, but not the only one. And you could, you know, jury rig things so fish could get by, but it was still a pretty dead river. So it's, it's not, I, I would prefer the language was, was more holistic about ecological integrity, and I would be happy to um, give that as direction to our WAC member to emphasize that more holistic language over narrow, narrow uh, fish passage language. <clears throat> that language that's in the, the proposal that's already been submitted by this joint group to PG&E isn't something we can modify. And even the letter that we're signing on to, because it's a joint letter between all of these agencies, some of which have already approved it, I understand we we really don't have the option to, to add sentences to that. So I'm comfortable signing on to the letter because the alternative is no local voices in this conversation as it goes forward. And I think this is a this proposed JPA is a reasonable um, local voice in it. Um, and I just want to contrast with the you know, the, the two basin solution proposal was to take over operation of the existing system, which would have meant keeping the dams in place, and those dams are a disaster for fish passage and ecological integrity of the rivers as a whole. So so the, the current proposal, which everybody acknowledges means removing those dams um, to a much more natural flow, uh, is is a huge step up for the rivers, for the eel river's health from um, from maintaining the current system. Um, I also do have a fair bit of faith in Sonoma Water's ability to provide for water supply and ecological integrity given their history on Dry Creek. Thanks. Yeah, you make a really good point on the Dry Creek stuff because they've taken that biological opinion and really done, you know, a lot with Dry Creek. Anybody that um, has been up there can see, you know, the amount of work that's happened. And it really is n not only um, ecologically sound, it, it was a lot less expensive, and it looks very nice um, and puts things more naturally, uh, puts habitat naturally back there, so. Can I just add, mm -hmm. um, just add to what um, Councilmember Ford said, is even though we can't update any of the letters that have already been in the proposals, can we have our WAC member just bring something to the meeting at, at the WAC and just kind of, from Katali's perspective, just add the emphasizing the ecological integrity of the plan? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and actually, that's, that's what I was going to say, is like when we talk to Laura, can we just make sure, because I agree this is just a better phrasing a more um, precise phrasing of what our intention is. And so um, I would, you know, ask Laura to please, you know, 
sign it so that we can have a voice and with that voice um, try and bring uh, this idea of ecological integrity, not just fish migration and water flow. Okay, would um, someone then, uh, is this, uh, we need a motion? Okay, I'm ready. Okay. So I move that we authorize our walk member to sign a joint letter of support for Sonoma's water proposal to amend PG&E's draft license surrender applications for the Potter Valley project. I'll second the motion. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Any no's? Any abstains? That will be a 4-1. Okay, thank you for that. Four yes and one absent. And one absent, yes. Um, okay, we've already done item B. So, Damien, I think we're up to you. All right, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. So, um, all right, so um, pretty soon, October 28th, it's just right, on, right around the corner, um, our police department is hosting another um, drug take back event. This is Saturday, October 28th, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. here um, on East School Street behind City Hall at the Ray um, Miller Community Room. And um, just a reminder, we also have a, uh, a drug, um, prescription drug bin in the lobby of the police department as well. It's always there. So that's also al always available to people. Um, the, uh, the pavement maintenance project is largely complete except for the striping and the legends and the, basically the street markings. So that's gonna be um, uh, done in the next week or two. And um, this is just a part of our ongoing annual um, projects to um, perform preventative maintenance on our streets and avoids much more costly treatments if the roadways were allowed to degrade. Uh, we, are, uh, we currently have out to bid our Cypress Avenue, Cypress Avenue sewer um, repair project. So that's out there right now and this is um, in advance of the planned um, Cypress and Redwood Drive repaving project, which would be next spring. So we're just getting in there and fixing the sewer main before we pave it over. So we, you know, for obvious reasons, we need to dig, dig up new asphalt. Uh, mentioned countryside. And uh, so we also have, um, coming up soon, um, we have our active transportation plan um, is, is underway. And in case anybody's wondering what that is, <laughs> that is, uh, that's uh, your grandparents' bike and ped master plan. So <laughs> there's now active transportation, so it's just more than bikes and, and uh, walking. Now it's all sorts of micro mobility modes of travel, so now it's an active transportation plan. And um, we have a consultant leading the effort for the, um, for the city, and this is a component of a countywide effort as um, we've talked about before. We have a pop-up outreach event planned for Oliver's on Monday, October 30th from 4 to 7 p.m. And um, planning staff would appreciate hearing from members of the community interested in bike and ped or micro-mobility issues um, in the city. There's also a survey um, that's available on the front page of the city's website, I think in the news feed. And comments can also be provided directly to the, um, the planner for this project, which is J.P. Harry's. And um, a workshop presentation and status update on the active transportation plan will be held um, at the Planning Commission meeting um, on November 6th at 6 p.m. as well. The Santero Way specific plan update is also underway and um, we're looking for feedback from the community. This is, um, there is project specific information on the um, community development webpage, including links to a survey that's also out right now for the Santero plan update. Um, staff is sending out a letter and flyer announcing the notice of preparation for the EIR, which includes links to the survey in English and Spanish. So that's um, also going out here shortly. Interested community members are invited to attend. Um, this is again the same planning commission meeting November 6th. So it's gonna be a pretty busy planning commission meeting. And the planning commission meeting is um, for the NOP scoping. It's the notice of preparation scoping meeting to provide comments to city staff. And then um, this 
past Friday and Saturday was the first weekend of our first ever Katati Fall Festival at Veranda Fletty Ranch. And it was, um, it was very successful over the two days. We had two, um, over 250 guests at this brand new event. There is still one more weekend left to enjoy the festival. That's this coming Friday and Saturday. And uh, Friday, it's 3.30 to 6. Saturday, it's 10 to 4 p.m. Um, the fee for the festival is $5 for anyone over three. Um, children three and under are free. It includes a pumpkin for every child. And we have pumpkin painting, pumpkin and squash bowling, crafts, games, pick you, uh, you pick veggies, I think is what they're calling it, from the garden, a, um, a tour of, this, of the aquaponics system, and um, where you can learn about how fish help the fruit and vegetables in the greenhouse grow. And if you're interested, um, Gary, who runs the aquaponics system, would love to tell you all about it. So just make sure you have a, a backup plan to get out of that conversation eventually when, you're, when you've heard everything you need to know. Um, photo opportunities and visit with the animals. There's also going to be live music on Saturday between 11, 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. This coming Tuesday, October 31st, um, for those of you that don't know, that's Halloween, um, but I think everyone knows. It's our fourth annual Candyland trick-or-treat event in the Plaza Park and throughout Katahdi, and this is a free event from 2 to 5 p.m., and it starts in La Plaza Park by visiting our booth, and um, there you can get a map of um, almost 50 um, businesses where you can trick-or-treat this year. So it's, um, it's growing each year, which is very cool. And um, to do it, we've partnered with um, over 50 local businesses, and um, it's a daytime event. Obviously, it's for the little ones so that they can um, trick-or-treat and um, get lots of candy and go home, hopefully, and go to bed early if they can fall asleep after all the candy um, before the older kids go out when the sun goes down. Um, we also, um, I mentioned this before, but we have a, another fun and free activity at Sandy Loam right now with the Scarecrow Contest at the ranch. And you can get together with your family, your business, your, um, your class, or other group to make um, your handmade Scarecrow for a contest. And they'll be on display at the ranch in early November and voted on by the public. So if you guys want to Make a scarecrow, and now's your chance. And then um, on Saturday, November 4th at 1 p.m., we're hosting a community design workshop for Sunflower Park here at Katati City Hall. And people can also attend um, by Zoom virtually if you can't make it in person. And this will be just the initial, um, initial conversation based on the 2019 master plan, um, you know, what the community wants to see with Sunflower Park. So lots of park workshops lately. And then um, just a couple other things in November, Sandy Loam is having their fall garden workshop and Camp Katati's Thanksgiving break camp will also be running during that week when school is out. So um, I'll leave it at that, but I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any on that. Just one, what's the time of the October 30th, October 30th Oliver's pop-up? on the active transportation plan? Yeah, that is uh, October 30th from 4 to 7 p.m. Thanks. Yep. And on that pop-up, Damien, um, since, um, you know, having done things there before, are they limiting it to Katati residents, or are they, since it, it usually is about a third of the people coming into Oliver's are from Katati and then Two thirds are from, you know, Roner Park, Pengrove, you know, from all over the place. Are we? Uh, well, usually we take comments from anyone, but I don't know if there's a way to. Do you know for the uh, for that pop up event if there's a plan to distinguish between um, Katati residents versus other people? The questionnaire asks people to identify uh, okay. where they're from. There's okay. a whole survey, yeah. lots of information. Too. Because if we get a bunch of comments from people from Roner Park, I would think that we would want to pass those on to, you know, Werner Park because their needs and, and what they want may be different, you know, than, than ours. And you know, not that we don't want to capture them, but, you know, passing them off. <laughs> unless they say what active transportation measures would make them come shop in Katati more. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that that's one of the questions, but maybe it will be. <laughs> and, I, and I will say, uh, that is uh, actually beneficial because it's uh, we're, our update is a part of the broader county update, and one of their main goals is to ensure connectivity amongst all the right. uh, transportation alternative transportation methods right. um, countywide. Right. It's just 
kind of important if you know they have recommendations for a certain spot somewhere else that we kind of share that because it yeah. doesn't you know there's not much we can do to like change Warner Park Expressway say for instance so okay thank you for that and then um, I guess I will move on to City Council member reports okay start start Okay, so uh, last week I went to the Mayor's and Council Members Legislative Committee meeting and there's an invite first uh, to the Council, to the whole Council to attend the next meeting, November 9th. It'll be in Santa Rosa and uh, Senator McGuire will be speaking at that one. So he'll be giving us an update. Um, so they said to invite the whole Council. So at the meeting uh, we had uh, received a report from uh, Assemblymember Cecilia Aguiar-Curry and so she talked about how leadership is more rural based now at the state level with the new speaker being Roberto Rivas from um, Speaker of the Cal State Assembly and she's a pro tem uh, now at the State Assembly and she talked about ACA 1 which is a constitutional amendment that's going to be on the ballot to um, reduce the threshold from two-thirds vote to 55 percent for local affordable housing and public infrastructure um, things that come through. So there was a discussion on that and um, there was also some discussion about housing and we did bring up mobile home parks. So um, uh, she did say about how it is like a sticky issue and it is happening in other parts of uh, the area. So we, there was some discussion about that as well. Um, and there was also discussion about supporting ACA 13 um, which I believe is like transportation uh, funding. So that's uh, also coming up too. So that was last week, um, and that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ken? Sure, a couple things that I would have recorded at last meeting, but I was sick. Thank you all for carrying on without me. Um, on October 4th was the Measure O Oversight Committee. I'm one of the city's representative, not Katati, but the Mayors and Council Members Association reps on that. And we learned that the state now mandates 24-7 mobile crisis response by counties. So we're, we were a good year and a half ahead of the game, but that is, um, but the county is now scrambling to take their mobile crisis response teams to 24-7. And there's a requirement that that, the state requirement is that that be a non-law law enforcement re response. So the county's program until now has always been a co-response of the sheriff with, with their mobile crisis response. And apparently the new, it probably starts the first of next year, I'm not sure, the, the state's new requirement is that the county provide non-law enforcement response and the county is working on setting up a dedicated hotline and they claim they're working with the cities so that they will, their 888 crisis response hotline will, will integrate with our crisis response so that whoever answers that phone will be able to send people, send the right people out. So I hope that's true. Have you all heard about this? Uh, yeah, so it would be, uh, it's, it's supposed to be in effect January 1. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, specifically a Medi-Cal requirement, as I understand it. But it, it, it's effectively the same thing. Right. And um, they, did, they are setting up a line. How that communication pathway is going to work is still TBD, you know, yeah. to make sure that it's not confusing to people, right. the users, you know, the public. Right. Right, I think it's an important point that some people are reluctant to call law enforcement dispatchers to get a mobile crisis response. And so if they, if we have an alternate route, that's great. Um, and then the next day was Sonoma Clean Power and Council Member Lemus reported on some of that uh, last meeting as I heard from my sick bed as I watched you all. Um, but one, I, an additional thing I wanted to mention is that that board has gone to no remote comment as has the county supervisors and I think Santa Rosa School Board and a couple others because of um, virtual hate speech. So um, I'm grateful we haven't had to do that here yet but we have to keep our eyes on it. One other uh, thing that I wanted to mention from that meeting is that Sonoma Clean Power provides um, assistance to Nonprofits wishing to purchase electric vehicles, they have a $22,500 um, assistance to nonprofits looking to buy a greater than 1,500 pound payload vehicle like a safe van. So, if we want to encourage our partners to join us in moving to an electric vehicle fleet, we should point that program out to them. Thanks. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, so um, there was only one, um, again, the two by two by two got canceled again. Mm -hmm. I know it's really sad, especially when there's only two that I can actually go to. It just is heartbreaking to me when one of them gets canceled. Um, the other one, the library advisory board, um, I'm just gonna plead humanity on this one. Um, I am a school teacher by day and one of my students was killed over the weekend that I've had for the last two years and I just couldn't do another thing. And so um, I went home after school that day and did not try and go to another meeting after being there for my you know, colleagues and my other students and myself. Um, and uh, so I don't have anything to report on that front, um, but I do, um, I will still be doing Coffee with Kay tomorrow from six to eight, it's the fourth Wednesday of the month, um, from six to eight at Redwood Cafe, and would be delighted if anyone wanted to come and share with me what's working great and what you think could be better and what we can do to address what's going on for you. So that's my full report. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, let's see, so on October 11th, I attended the Marin Sonoma Vector Control and they gave a pretty good uh, report about some samplings of different things that are going on with this year. Um, with, with the mosquitoes and they saw some different patterns of things and they didn't really have answers for it um, as to why they were seeing what they were seeing but but it was interesting nonetheless and uh, they're they're trying to you know correlate different years with what's happening so that was interesting on the 12th I attended um, our uh, Sonoma groundwater um, basin meeting and at that it was announced that we received a 5.38 million grant um, so that is really wonderful um, and I can't I was looking for the numbers for the other two Craig might have them um, I can't remember what they were exactly but I think in total we got about 15 million for the three basins um, which was great. So um, we'll be able to do a lot of really good work with with trying to, um, you know, uh, make sure that our groundwater um, is kept and functioning and is sustainable. So that was really great news. Um, Suzanne Smith's retirement party was also that day. So there was God. There was a lot of people there. So it was. Um, sad to see her go. Um, she was the executive director for um, Sonoma County Transportation Authority for 26 years. She was the first uh, director there and they did, you know, a whole um, thing about her 26 years and, and that was really interesting to see, you know, everything that, that she'd done um, over those years. A lot of really good work, so I'm glad that she's moving on into retirement. Um, then I went to the uh, mayors and council members meeting that night and we had a couple of presentations. We had one presentation from the Sonoma County Hospitality Association and it's kind of how they work and what they're doing with the tourism board um, for Sonoma County. So that was really interesting. And then we, um, the chair, um, Ariel, Kelly um, showed us a presentation because the, the people that were supposed to give it uh, united against hate. There was a presentation, so she walked us through the presentation. Um, so that was really um, also very interesting and enlightening um, on the things that you know we can do um, against hate, especially in light of you know the things that have been happening elsewhere. Um, on uh, October 14th, I. Um, sat quietly and watched the workshop for the Veranda uh, Floody Ranch. Got, you know, some really good um, input on that. Um, so I know staff is taking that back and, and moving forward. It was a nice turnout. Um, on the 18th through the 20th, um, I attended um, LAFCO con conference as, I, as a, a board member of LAFCO. And that was really interesting to see what is happening. You know, I only have the perspective of our Sonoma County LAFCO. So it was really interesting to see the um, 
you know, the workings of, of the LAFCOs, you know, all over the state, both big and small, and some of the things that they're doing and the processes they use. So very useful information for someone who's new on that board. Um, and then today we had our first subcommittee meeting on the polling questions, which I thought went well. So we're progressing on that, and that shall be coming shortly. And that is all I have. So next item is public comment on non-action agenda items. Yes, Neil. Yes, good evening. Um, I just want to say thank you very much for the Zoom process. I do use it at home. It does make it quite something just to be able to put it on and, of course, mute for a bit and then listen to, you know, relevant bits that are on there. Um, I also wanted to say, you know, that, um, or ask the question for the ATP, the transport plan, when would that be coming back to the Planning Commission? So thank you very much. I think you were out of the room when, um, when uh, Damien mentioned oh, that, that, but he can, he can reiterate those or give that information to you. Um, Thank you. you. I have just it. heard the October 2030th birth date. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, November Damien's 6th. Got it. November 6th. November 6th. Planning Commission. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh huh. Anyone else? Then can we go to our Zoom attendees? Speaking to our Zoom attendees, please use the raise hand icon if you'd like to make a public comment. Mayor Harvey, that'll end public comment. All right, thank you for that. Then we will move on to information received after the agenda was posted. And Kevin? Uh, yes, there were uh, a total of five items received. Four of them made it in time to be uploaded to the web agenda before the meeting. Uh, letters uh, regarding item 11A, um, as well as an item for citizens' business. And there was one letter that came in, uh, also about 11A, that was provided to the council and is in print here in the chamber tonight and will be uploaded to the web agenda tomorrow. Thank you for that. All right. So anything else, anybody? No? Then I will call this meeting adjourned at 7.53. And thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs>